Everybody got quiet. Good to see y'all this morning. Good to have you. I think we're going to have a good time. Y'all going to have a good time? I said, I think we're going to have a good time, everybody. Yeah. I've had a good time already, so we should do it again. we got a few announcements. Actually, we got quite a few. Get your notepad out. So today, right after the service, we have youth bowling. And if they want to go, Debbie, is it too late to add? No? Where do we go? Just to the van? To the rec building? The van is right here. If you would like to go, come to the van. That would be a good sign. And then next Sunday, we have our pink out. We have all these pink pumpkins around, and that's about our pink out, which October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we'll be taking up, well, we're not taking up money. There'll be donations made for everybody who's wearing pink, visible pink, they said. So no socks or anything else under the pink, but outer pink. Um, <clears throat> so wear pink next week. There'll be a donation made on, uh, for breast cancer. And then next Monday night, the 31st, we have Trunk or Treat, which will be down here around the rec building. I'm not sure if we can go in the rec building. Anyway, it'll be worked out. Our usual Trunk or Treat outside or inside the rec building. So show up. It's from 5 to 8. Yes, 5 to 8 for Trunk or Treat, and that'll be fun. Yes, please. I need help. Good, perfect, thank you. Perfect, so some of those chilies last year are so hot, I need another year before we get to that. I mean, really. Was good. What's that? Yeah, that's right. They were good, but a couple of them were like, yeah. The spoon melted on the way. All right, and then we have November 5th, we have our Tom Pryor Memorial Golf Tournament. So it's not in the summer like it was. We've moved it to November, and Brian says, do the same thing you've always done, but maybe wear a little more clothes than you did before, because it'll be November. So whatever you've done in the past, donations, playing, or if you haven't done anything you want to get involved, please do. That's coming up. And then we have our shoe boxes. We're collecting or our Operation Christmas Child, you know we're very involved in that. If you haven't got a shoebox, get one. If you have any questions, usually it's Tammy or Jenny. Now, somebody, Evelyn, just ask anybody and they'll point you in the direction. So if you have questions. And then Angel Tree is coming up. You guys are the med ones. If you have questions about Angel Tree, see Todd and Nancy, raise your hand. All right, and then we're also taking up for St. Jude, right? St. Jude, yeah, taking up collection for St. Jude. There's a collection box in the vestibule for that. And then the wonderful sweet taters got some words to say about the women's tea. All right, it's that time again. We are um, starting to sign up for the ladies' tea. If you're not aware of what that is, annually, we have a women's tea event. The um, women's committee here puts that on. And you can sign up to host a table. There are a maximum of 16 tables this year. I think that's what we can fit in there reasonably and still be able to walk around a little bit. And um, if you do host a table, you will decorate it. And um, you can invite people to sit at your table. Or you can just let people who just want to sign up 
um, maybe they don't go to church here and they, they let us know that they want to come, you can let them. I have done that every year. I've let somebody sit at my table, two, three, four people, that I didn't know who they were going to be until that day of. And can I tell you that that has blessed me every time. I love getting to know the people in our community that come out. And, um, and then I always have some people there that I do invite to. So if you want to host a table, um, you can sign up. There are four tables already taken on this sheet. So 16 total, if you, it's first front come, first serve. Even if you've done this every year for the past six years, if you don't get your name on there before they run out, you don't get a table. So get your name on there. And then um, we have a wonderful speaker this year. I'm really excited to hear her. And we have, um, we will have childcare again this year. There's a green sheet out front. If you need childcare, you can um, sign up the child there. There are, on every one of these sheets are the deadline. So like childcare, we need to know by November 23rd. Um, and if you're gonna sign up to do a table, we need to know by the 27th. And also, if you would like to just attend, um, you can sign up here. And there are plenty of spaces for you there. And we need to know that by November 27th. Also, the event this year will be on Saturday, December 3rd at 2.30 in the afternoon, and it will be in the rec building, just like it always has, and um, we're gonna have a good time. Thank you. Get the Christmas price. Wednesdays at seven, we're rehearsing in the choir room. Right, and that'll be on December 18th. It's gonna be good. My kids are already singing songs around the house. So we'll know them. I'll be singing them by December 18th. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else? Coat drive ends this Wednesday. What is it? The coat drive ends this Wednesday. The coat drive ends this Wednesday. Yeah, so it's going to be uh, at work or here at the university. You're at Ingalls on Howard Gap. Yeah. So if you want to do coat drive, socks, new underwear, new socks. Gently used coats, that kind of thing. Bring them to Bill, either in the nursery and he'll pick them up, or to Ingalls on Howard Gap. And that ends this Wednesday. We've had quite a lot of donations this time around for the homeless. Good, thank you. Anything else? All right. Let's turn to our prayer list. We've got a lot of folks on our prayer list. Um, <clears throat> Gene Bradley, Angie Dixon. Praying for Joyce Driggers, uh, Liz Garrett, Jackie Griffin, we're praying, praying for you, William Hewitt, Barbara Israel, I'm looking around to see Carol, Janice Jones, they're not here, I haven't seen, don't see them, Hoyt and Ann Jones are in the first service, praying for Connie Lauder, Chris Lida, Joel McCraw, Rusty Medlin, Ashton Melton, and we're praying for Miss Tammy Melton. She just had surgery, two back surgeries this week to repair one issue. And she's at home yes, as of yesterday. She's doing better than they thought. And Brian was on the fence whether he would be here today. And finally, he got off the fence about 8.45 last night. So y'all are stuck with me. But she's doing well. Continue to pray for her healing. They said in every step she did better than they thought. So that's good news. Um, Faye Messer, praying for Miss Faye. Donna Overcash, we continue to pray for you and your family. Marsha Pace, uh, Vicki Patterson, Patricia Price, Woody Price, Marie Pryor, she was here with us in the first service. Pat Rhodes, Gertha Shipman, Miss Kay, praying for Miss Kay Smith. Paul and Janet Vaughn, keep praying for them. I know that. Paul is on this line. He, uh, she's called me once, and we went and visited them. And he's, it's kind of like the Lord's calling him home. But we're, you know, just keep praying for them because there's an amazing comfort there, beyond just what's happening here. And I think they're grasping that right now. So Chris, pray for Chris Winford, Brenda Zeman. And then I got a call the other day from Janet Vaughn about Teresa Berwick's, Berwick's son. 
she moved to California. Her son's in California, Greg Sheeks. He just got diagnosed with cancer, and so she asked for prayer. Anyone else? Anything else? We all have unspoken. Y'all stand up and let's pray. <coughs> yes. <coughs> Father God, we are so very thankful to be able to just close our eyes, open our eyes, stand up, sit down, lay down, doesn't matter, that we can talk to you anytime we want. And we come to you right now. We pray for the folks on this prayer list. We pray for each one of us who have unspoken prayer requests. And we're all going through different things, and, and ultimately our goal is to all become closer to you. And I pray that for everyone that's in this list and others that are hurting and struggling, that there be glory for you on the other side of that or during it, that they can see, we can all see, and uh, just pray that you work through it in only ways that you know how that brings glory to you. We thank you because you know all the best things for us, better than what we think should happen. And I pray for this service, I pray for all of us together here this morning that we are here to worship you, to praise you, to uh, grow closer to you, to learn about you, to talk about you. I pray that this time be for you, through you, by you, because of you, every preposition we can think of, you, you, Lord. That's why we're here, and not just here in this building. That's why we walk every day, talk, breathe, and everything we do is for you. And I pray that this time as the band cranks up that we praise you wonderfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, PSA first, before we sing, a friend of my husband there is a blue Chevrolet truck in the parking lot that he's running, and the doors are locked. So, whoever's truck, I don't know. Maybe they're playing Murado. <laughs> blue Silverado. What? Blue Silverado. Blue Silverado. We know it's a Chevrolet, so it's not Jackie Bolton. <laughs> Jackie Morgan, Jackie Morgan won't drive it. You know, God is so good, and I had the honor and the privilege of going with some ladies to hear four speakers uh, Saturday, and we had an awesome time and such an uplifting spirit. But right now, I want you to close your eyes. Just close your eyes. Why are you here? You know, God. He is so good to us. We fail him so much. But this first song we're singing is just think about I'm forgiven. Everybody say that. I'm forgiven. Because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. And your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. So remember while we're here, we're here to worship God. Just get that in your head right now. Not where you're going to go eat after and why the preacher isn't here. And just pray for David. Pray for us. We need your prayers. And let's all rejoice in these songs.
It was my 
tell you how it fills my heart and my soul to be back in my little spot here in my little church here with my little family here you know for a couple weeks me and Greg both been sick and uh, you know it's like I'm so tired of this I'm so tired of this (laughs) dear God I'm so tired of this you know but when you're sick and you can't talk as y'all can tell I swallow the frog I'm sitting in my chair in the living room. Greg's sitting across from me in his chair, and I'm texting him because I can't talk. <laughs> and he's like, where's my phone? I'm like, thank you, phone. Who knew? But God gets your attention, and he placed it on my heart that I am, even in my darkest hour, even when I'm sick and I'm like, oh, I'm going to die. I am wonderfully and fearfully made. How about that? Wonderfully and fearfully made. So when you feel bad, just remember, you're God's creation, you're God's child, and you are wonderfully and fearfully made. And we're going to sing a song for you now that we really like, but none of us can walk and talk and clap and sing at the same time. So, Blake, can you give them the, the beat of it? It's pretty fun. You want me to ooh, clap, and say, no. <laughs> None of us are coordinated enough to do that. I am so sorry. So your job for this song is to keep us on time. Because, you know, yeah, somebody keep our tempo, please. And preacher, this song is for you and Tammy, yep. if you're watching. All right, boys.
That was exciting. I don't know how I can come up here after that. <clears throat> I was trying to walk slow, but I couldn't after that song. Wow. I'm going to pray because I need it. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you just have your way with all of us. This absolutely has nothing to do with me, but with all of you. I pray for all of us here that this word, this message that you've given, you've shared, is for all of us, my ears, all of our ears, all of our hearts. And I pray that you have your way with us for the next little while, because I need you, simply you, and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know what was going on. There was a whole bunch of extra ladies coming in. <laughs> the back door while the music was playing, so those were good songs y'all picked. Um, but I understand y'all are from Grace, Baptist, and Gastonia. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry to tell you. God brought me here. <laughs> and I understand our brother, David McEachern, who was at Bat Cave, yes. is Josh's pastor. Yes. I've seen, I've been there, we visited a couple times. Yeah, amazing preacher, yes. man of God. Yeah, this will not be David McEachern level right here. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. <clears throat> sorry. So I have a question. Anybody remember, it's been weeks since I preached last. I don't expect you to know. What did I preach about last? Anybody remember where we were at, what we were talking about? All these ladies that came in, they're excused from that question. <laughs> Nancy. The ultimate treasure. We were at talking about the parable of the hidden treasure. The man who sold everything he owned to buy the field where the treasure was buried so it would belong to him. What was the treasure, Nancy? <laughs> That's right. In the parables, the kingdom of heaven, our ultimate treasure is Jesus. Right? He is Jesus. Jesus is our ultimate treasure. And I'm not going to preach that again, although that was exciting. This man in this parable sold everything he had with joy to possess the treasure, right? The treasure is Jesus. It's not heaven. It's not a pass from hell. It's Jesus, simply Jesus. Heaven's going to be amazing, but we're going to be focused on Jesus. Walking on gold streets will mean nothing. He's the treasure. So, <clears throat> the question God led me to this week, and Brian's going to put it up on the screen, and this is not going to make no sense to you. Am I an Adipat? Anybody know what that is? Raise your hand. Good. Donna knows. Don't tell anybody. Am I an Adipat? What in the world is Adipat? We're going to talk about that. And I want to tell you through a testimony for, of the late Stephen Olford. Anybody heard of Stephen Olford? Right. He's a really good author. He was a really good preacher, teacher of the Bible. Stephen Olford was an American Christian leader, although he wasn't born in America. And Billy Graham called him the man who most influenced my ministry. Okay. Olford was also a role model to pastors like Charles Stanley, Adrian Rogers, and he was an influence on the life of the famous missionary Jim Elliott. Anybody heard of Jim Elliott? Right. Jim Elliott has quite a story, and his wife has an even better one. I won't get into that, because that's a whole other. So this testimony, God showed me this many years ago, and I want to tell you, it's amazing. 
how he works. Brian asked me last Sunday, because Tammy was going to have surgery this week, and I'm not the regular preacher, uh, to have something ready. Monday morning, in my quiet time, God brought back this testimony of Stephen Alford. I've read it eight or ten years ago into my mind. And I got it out and was reading it again, and then about an hour later I go to my emails and I have a, te- a uh, devotion there, and it's talking about how to pat, which is, there. I mean, they're tied together. I can't do that stuff. I didn't sit down and go, all right, I'm so smart, I'm going to figure out what to preach. He just laid it out for me all week, and I just basically wrote down a bunch of stuff other people have said to share with you. Okay? And most of it's from the Bible. Stephen Alford was born to missionary parents, Frederick and Bessie Alford, in 1918. Frederick Alford's basic knowledge of medicine and the experience he gained in the mission field caused him to anticipate that there might be some complications while they were in the mission field. They were in Africa. And so they decided to make this thousand-mile trek, him and his wife, from Angola to the British colony of northern Rhodesia so they can have medical attention. And Fred, his dad, walked every step. thousand miles. Okay. The first 17 years of Stephen's life, Stephen Alford's life, were spent in the heart of Africa where he witnessed the marvelous power of God working through the lives of his godly parents. His experiences were in Africa flavored his preaching and his teaching and his books. Stephen Alford left home when he had known, he had known and loved the, sorry. Stephen Alford left home, the home he loved in Angolia and, and to live in England where he would pursue a career in engineering. He developed in his, this carburation. So he was an engineer, studying to be an engineer. And he was so good at it, he developed a special carburation system, and he took it and put it on motorcycles, and he started motorcycle racing with his new carburation. And one night, after a race, and it was rainy and cold, he crashed his motorcycle, and he laid there in the rain for hours. And he developed pneumonia, and the doctors told him he had two weeks to live. So this is a young man in college, fresh out of college, Lying on his deathbed, Stephen received a letter from his father in Africa, Frederick, who knew nothing of his son's condition because it was took take like three months for the mail to get there. All right, from from Africa to England, but in God's sovereignty, the letter contained the words that would forever change the life of Stephen Alford. His father wrote, and you've heard this before. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. Stephen fell under deep conviction. He slipped out of his bed. He dropped to his knees and cried out to God. And he said, Lord, you have won, and I own you as king and kings and lord of lords. And Lord, if you will heal my body, I will serve you anywhere, anytime, at any cost. And I remember those words almost every day since I read them eight or ten years ago. They, they're part of when I'm paying attention my daily life. We're going to talk about that. They were related to this adipat. God answered his prayer, and until he died in August, or August 2004, Stephen Alford was ablaze for the glory of God here in this world, influencing many people. You see one of his books? Get it, read it. He's really good Bible teacher. So the question is, what is Adipat? We doesn't quite line up exactly what Stephen Alford said, but it's the same idea. The same. What is Adipat? Adipat means anything, any place, any time. That means, meaning, I will follow Jesus no matter what it costs me, anything. No matter what it costs me. Well, 
I went to sit in the Sunday school class this morning and Todd was teaching. And we're talking about the same thing, just in a different part of the Bible. No matter what, no matter where he wants me to go, any place, I will follow him no matter where he wants me to go. And no matter when he wants, any time. Really, it's all the time. It's not just, I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to when he asks me. It's really all the time. Anything, any place, any time. And I'm sharing that with you because it's been such an influential phrase to me from this testimony of Stephen Alford. And basically, this is what God laid in my lap all week long, all week long, all the way through Sunday school. I got a devotion this morning that says the same thing. From Oswald Chambers, he's got a picture of a butterfly. It says, nothing of the old life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Beyond all things have become new. And, and we're going to talk about this more. But this is, this guy's saying the same thing to me. I'm not smart enough to do this. God's talking to us this morning. I'm just a fool up here with paper and a voice. I've been reading this book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Anybody know who C.S. Lewis is? This is a really good book. C.S. Lewis wrote The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He was an atheist. He is an English literature professor, or was, at Cambridge and Oxford University in England. He really knows how to use language. He understands words. And this book, Mere Christianity, just kind of goes through the foundations of like apologetics, which is defending my faith. Why do I believe what I believe? It's really good. And this week, here's some of the chapter I've been reading this week. He says, and, and I want to tell you this first before we get into that. Did you know that Jesus calls all of us as Christians to follow him? Anything, any place, any time. All of us. C.S. Lewis, in this chapter, he says, and he's talking about following Jesus. Following Jesus. There's a lot of words here, but listen. What I want to make clear is that this is not one among many jobs a Christian has to do. He's talking about following Jesus. Anything, any place, any time. And it is not a sort of special exercise for the top class. It is the whole of Christianity. All of it. Christianity offers nothing else at all. And I should like to point out how it differs from ordinary ideas of morality and being good. And before you go on with the next quote, Brian, he, he talks about in this chapter, that last phrase about morality and being good, is that it is a common teaching in the church nowadays that we can accept some Jesus and add him to our life that we're going to keep and do. And I'm following my dreams, and I'm chasing my dreams, and I'm doing what I want to do, but I like Jesus, and I want to keep him with me. And what he's saying is, is that we can't do both. He says, he goes on to say that it's not as about just accepting Jesus than mixing him into our life. And this is not in our quote, but I'm just elaborating some of the chapter. Trying to do better than we did before. I've said a prayer and now I'm going to just try to be better, a better version of myself. He says this is difficult. This is actually impossible because it's not true in Christianity. But it's being taught all the, all the time. Even like Jude says, I wanted to tell you about the gospel, but I have to tell you about this false preaching, which people are creeping into the church teaching about sensuality, which is how I feel. Well, I feel like I can have Jesus and still do what I want to do. C.S. Lewis is saying, this is the incorrect path. It's really impossible, and it's not Christianity at all. In the next quote, he says, the terrible thing 
the almost impossible thing of what we feel like is to hand over our whole self, all of your wishes and precautions. That's everything you dream about and everything you're scared of. To Christ. But it is far easier than we are all trying to do instead. It's far easier to surrender, to hand it over, than to try to walk this mixed life thinking that we're a Christian or, or that we're all in or we're not really all in or I just want to do my thing with some Jesus sprinkled in. For what we are trying to do is to remain what we call ourselves, to keep our personal happiness as a great aim in life and yet at the same time be good. He says that this is hard, this is difficult, because it's not real. In most cases, it is not real Christianity. And he goes on, the next quote says, the real Christian way is different, harder and easier, both harder and easier. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there, and I want to have the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or just stop it, but have it out. These are his words, C.S. Lewis. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires, which you think innocent as well as the ones you think are wicked. All the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead, Jesus. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. This is what God gave me this week to share with me, too. One of the ladies in our first service that went to, did y'all go to this ladies' retreat? Is that why y'all are, you're not a pulpit committee? She said that Mandisa said almost the same thing about trimming off limbs, but God cut the whole thing down at the stump. I didn't listen to that. This is C.S. Lewis in like 1948. Jesus wants us to exchange ourselves for him. Remember, he did this great exchange already. He took my sin, he that knew no sin, took on my sin, and he took on God's wrath, so I don't have to. And he died so that I can live to righteousness. He didn't die for us to just do what we want to do with some Jesus in our pocket. He wants us to follow him, to learn to be like him, and it takes self-abandonment. Like this ship is going down, I got to get out. Out of pack. <clears throat> Anything, any place, any time. Now look at this from Oswald Chambers this morning. He says, there is only one thing God wants of us, and that is our unconditional surrender. I got this this morning before I got in the shower. When we are born again, the Holy Spirit begins to work his new creation in us, and there will come a time when there is nothing remaining of the old life. Our old gloomy outlook disappears, as does our old attitude toward things, and all things are of God. How we are going to to get a life that has no lust, no self-interest, and not sensitive to the ridicule of others. How are we going to do that? Question mark. How will we have the type of love that is kind and not provoked and thinks no evil? The only way is by allowing nothing of the old life to remain and by having only one, having only simple, perfect trust in God. Such a trust that we no longer want God's blessings, 
but we only want God himself. I know this is heavy, but it's really freeing. You know what's heavy? It's trying to carry around our old stuff. I've had multiple people that have died in the 1900s send this stuff to me this week. <laughs> they didn't send it to me, right? Now let's look at our scripture. That was an introduction to our scripture, but we'll get out of here. Enough time to eat. I could spare some. So we're going to start in Luke 14, and then we're going to go back to Luke 9, because that's the order God showed me. And I want you to think about, I like context. I like to put myself there, what was going on when this was said, when this was done, because it helps us understand. Otherwise, when we just start reading, it's just words, and we're trying to process it. Brian's going to put it up on the screen, too, but man, the, pe the Bible pages sound awesome. So we're in the middle of Luke, roughly. Jesus has been, what kind of ministry did he have? Did he build a building and people came in to listen to him preach? No. He went out and around and around and around, talking sometimes to the same people and different people, and he walked for three to three and a half years, and he stayed in different places, and he, he was seeking to save the lost. Right? He went out to do it. We tend to come in and hope they'll show up here. <clears throat> and so, all this time, these guys, there's a crowd. And there's a crowd with him at this time. It says, great crowds, we're going to read. And the great crowds are people that are literally following him, not meaning that they are surrendered to him, that they're his disciple. Which, if y'all remember, Nancy, from two times ago when I preached, we preached on discipleship, which is being a follower of Jesus. He's called all of us to be disciples. This is not for an elite group or just for the pastors, people that go to school, deacons, everybody that he gives his life to is called to follow him and make disciples. And so they've been watching him heal people, teach people, say these things, talk about God, talk about the kingdom of God, telling them that he's going to die and come back to life. He told them that multiple times, and they still didn't get it when he did, right? So they've been walking and listening to him, and there's a big crowd with him sometimes, and a lot of them are just curious. Just because they were literally physically following Jesus does not mean they were part of the church or they were part of his true disciples. They were curious. A lot of them just wanted, hey, can you heal my foot? So I can go back to doing what I want to do. I'm sick. Remember there were ten lepers. He healed. How many of them came back to thank him? One. The other nine went to do their thing. They took their life back. Now we don't know that, but that's what the Bible implies. A lot of these people were looking for a free meal. They wanted to see something cool. Or you're just following the crowd because the crowd is there. And he says to them, verse 25, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, right, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that's harsh, isn't it? But he's God. Now, is he saying that we got to despise them and do evil things to our family? No. He's saying compared to loving him, it should be like we hate them. It's a lesser than him. Because anything we put before God is an idol. I have to keep sweet tater out of that idol spot often. I have to keep my kids out of that spot. I have to keep whatever 
that I want is an idol. And that's what he's saying. Love me more. Verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay? Now what was the cross back then? We wear it around our neck. It represents that we follow Jesus. But what is the cross? What was the cross to them? In this context, when they saw a cross, it wasn't dangling a gold thing around somebody's neck. What was it doing? Death. It was usually somebody dangling from it, either dead or getting ready to be dead in a few hours. So when they said, when he said you must take up your cross, he's saying, you must be dead to yourself. Everything you want should be gone. Because I'm ready to die at any moment. If I'm carrying this cross around, it reminds me this life is not about me, it's for him. Verse 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, and all who sees it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Right? It'd be like if I want, I want to add a front porch to our house because we have like a stoop and it's partially rotting and one day maybe we'll do it if God wants us to. But it's kind of like I decided today just to go build it and I go to Lowe's and I buy stuff and I call people and I call Seth and several other people and say, hey, come build this thing. And then I realize about halfway through that they all want money for it. So they leave. Now I got a half built porch five years from now that's still there, half built and rotting. And people are going, Well, look at that fool. He didn't even figure out what it was going to cost before he started it. And that's what Jesus is saying. Figure out what this is going to cost you before you come to me. He says in verse 31, Or what king going out to encounter another king at war will not sit down first and sell and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegate asking for terms of peace. He would be a fool if he did not figure out if his 10,000 men could take on those 20,000 men or not before they go to the battle line. Counting the cost first. So therefore, any of you who does not, not my words, renounce all, cannot be my disciple. Now flipping back to chapter 9, just a few verses. Same kind of context. He, Jesus has been talking, teaching, preaching, walking, telling them about the kingdom of God. They've been physically following him. They're curious. Some of them think they're all in. Some of them are not sure. And here come some guys that are they're walking along, and they come to him and say, like, I want to follow you. Now this is Jesus reacting to them. Verse 57, 9 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. So we were just talking about singing, wherever you go. That's anywhere. I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's telling that man, you want to follow me? I don't have a home. I sleep on the dirt with my head on the rock sometimes. Let's go. Wherever he goes. Now, is God calling us to be homeless? He's calling us to be willing to be homeless. Right? My house 
however much money I put into it, however many times I remodel it, and whatever, at some point it won't be there. And if nobody else does anything to it, it's going to rot. It rots every day. And we have to keep it from rotting so we can still live there. Jesus builds a place that doesn't rot. Doesn't decay. Doesn't need remodeling. To another, Jesus said to him, follow me. But this other guy, but he said, Lord, let me first and go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That's like, this guy was trying to use kind of scripture. Hey, I need to honor my mother and my father. I'm going to take care of my dad first. I would like to follow you, but I got to do this thing. Take care of my dad. He's sick. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. That means you, sir, have no real life in you. So you can go bury those others who have no real life. My real life is that I know Jesus. He wants me to be able to do anything for him. Another one. Yet, verse 61 says, Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Same kind of thing. I'll be back with you. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Miss Donna, why don't you come on up? Jesus is saying here, All of my old life is behind me. Everything that I was is now behind me. When I exchange my life for him and his for mine, he's saying that you need, like a farmer who puts his hand to the plow. How many farmers we got in here? Do you plow your rows looking backwards? Looking over your shoulder? What happens to the row? Right. All over the place. It is not straight. And so he says, if you come to me and you keep your eye on me, don't look back. Don't look at what you left behind. Don't look at what I used to be, what I want to be, what I feel like being, what I think I should be, what kind of career I should have, what kind of money I can make, what kind of house I can have, who can I marry, how many kids am I going to have. I don't know what else my brain will let me keep up with, but he's saying, don't look back. Just look at him and keep coming, following him, going to him. I'm going to him, and nothing else that's going on around me matters. It's just him. And we feel like we're losing so much when we do that. That's the lie. We're gaining him. He is everything. Do you know what Satan worship is? And you guys in the back, y'all don't say anything. Does Satan want us to worship him? Who does he want us to worship? He wants us to worship ourself. When he tempted Adam and Eve, he didn't say, if you eat the fruit, you'll be worshiping me instead of him. He said, you will be like God. And that's what he wanted for himself, was to be like God. And when he says, he wants all of us to join him, and then he's beat God. If I'm worshiping myself and following my life and doing my dreams and doing all the things I think I need to do and want to do, this is what Satan wants. The satanic church church, they stole our word, preaches and teaches 
self-worship, self-preservation, self-conceit. How do I feel? What do I want? What do I think? Jesus says, it doesn't matter. Do not lean on your own understanding. Don't follow your heart because it's wicked. Just follow me. And all this stuff that's behind you that was so heavy and it's hard to keep up with, we won't miss it at all. At all. Because he will fill that in with something, him, that's so much more amazing than we could ever think. So my invitation to you today Wherever you are, you don't have to come down here. You can be wherever you are. There's a lot of people in the church, and I don't mean this one specifically. I don't know your heart and if Holy Spirit lives inside of you or not. There's a lot of people. One of Satan's biggest tools is the deceit. I said a prayer when I was little. I show up for church most of the time. And he's deceiving us and lying to us. And we think that, okay, I'm doing my thing. And like C.S. Lewis said, I'm trying to be good and make good decisions. And I got a little Jesus in my pocket. And I tithe and I go to church sometimes. And Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, depart from me because I never knew you. All these people who did this in my name and said this in my name, did this in my name, He's got so many people thinking that they're saved and they're not. And then maybe you are saved. I have to die every day. I have to look at this anything, any place, any time, every day. When I wake up and my eyes open, I have to make a decision before I put my feet on the ground. Is this day mine or his? Is this body mine or his? If it was his, he'd do much better with it, right? <laughs> Are my thoughts his? Is my heart his? Am I going to do his will today or mine? And, and, and it's my invitation. Maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe you don't know. You're not sure. Because the Bible says to examine yourself to make sure you're in the faith. Only you know that. And if you know you are saved and you couldn't give it all up like Zacchaeus, right? We were talking about Sunday school. Zacchaeus climbed that tree and he abandoned everything about himself after that. I give all the money back to all the people I cheated. I don't need this lifestyle of being rich tax collector anymore. He just wanted Jesus. I'll close your eyes and we'll pray. And if God's speaking to you, and just do whatever you want. Come down here, stand where you are. Don't, don't be too proud. Father God, I pray for all of us, the folks on Facebook that might be listening, I pray, Lord, that you... Make it so clear, your gospel message. It's not about coming down an aisle and saying a prayer and adding a little Jesus to our lives. It's about abandoning our old lives, dying to ourselves. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but he that lives in me. And I pray, Lord, that we all know this. We all feel it, that you come to us and convict us, those who don't know you, who think they do, who are deceived by the great deceiver. He is so good at what he does that you clear that away and let them see that they don't know you. And I pray for us that do already know you, Lord, that thank you for saving us, thank you for making us yours, and thank you for living inside of me. That is the most ridiculous thing and wonderful that I forget and we forget so easily how close we are to you closer to in, than anything else 
And I pray, God, that we all know this, that every day we step out of our beds, we roll over, and we say, anything, any place, any time, God, anything, any place, any time, anything, any place, any time. And we say that all day long, every day. Today, as we leave here, tomorrow morning, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every day until you take us home. Anything, any place, any time, all of me is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Band, if y'all want to come up. <laughs>